Hi, my name is Bob Green and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. This day I am going to talk about this paper by Leonid Uritskoev and V. I. Liksonov and V. G. Sinov. I hope I got that right. Uh, observation of transformation of chemical elements during electric discharge. That was published in Annals Fondation Louis de Broly, uh, volume 27, number 4, 2002. And I actually read this some years ago and it inspired me to use magnets on the echo fuel. However, I confess that I really skim read it and didn't really take on board much of what it says. And rereading it yesterday and today, I can honestly say it is a just amazing, amazing paper. And I encourage you to really look at it in detail. Anyway, it's at the Kirchhoff Institute where a lot of this research was done. And I will read you the abstract. Results of experimental studies of electric explosion in water of foils made of extremely pure materials are presented. New chemical elements detected both by spectroscopic measurements during the electric discharge and by mass spectrometer analysis of sediments after the discharge have been found to appear. A strange radiation associated with the transformation of chemical elements has been registered. A hypothesis has been put forward that particles of the strange radiation have magnetic charge. So, introduction. The physics of electric explosion of wires in water has been discussed in many papers, reviews and monographs, and he cites three there, and one is Electric Explosion of Conductors, Moscow, Mu, uh, 1965, Scientific Principles and Technologies of Discharges from Kiev in 1990, and Electrical Explosion of Conductors, and that was also in 1990. A feature of such an electric explosion scheme is that reflected waves act on the plasma channel produced in a closed volume. An additional increase of the energy input into the channel can be attained by initiating the discharge by wires made of materials which has a larger thermal effect in reactions with water. These are titanium, zirconium and beryllium. The present work was initially dedicated to study of the efficiency of electric explosions of titanium foils in water to shatter concrete. So it would appear that this work came about purely as a byproduct of investigating the parameters for an industrial use of exploding titanium foils, which was normally used to shatter concrete. Anyway, experiment scheme, diagnostics and results. Capacitor battery has been discharged into a foil in water. The load was a titanium foil that was welded to titanium electrodes by pressure contact welding. The electrodes were mounted on polyethylene cover, which in turn was attached through seals to the expansion chamber, also made of polyethylene. Distilled water was used. The number of loads varied from one to eight in different experiments. And so it's got a schema of the basic thing here. And so you essentially have uh, a capacitor bank. You have a spark gap here. Uh, you have your uh, titanium uh, pure electrode, and then you have your titanium foil, and then uh, you have polyethylene, 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 and you have uh, some water in there which is distilled. During experimental studies of electric explosion of foils in water, an intensive glowing was found to appear above the dielectric cover. So this is the explosion above this dielectric cover. In figure two, we present oscillograms of signal from the photodiode and the photomultiplying tube mounted above the dielectric cover. As seen from the oscillograms, at the moment of the current disruption, which is noted by many authors, a glowing emerges above the explosion chamber, which persists over a time period exceeding the current pulse duration by more than 10 times. Since the beginning of the glowing coincides with the voltage drop, it is tempting to explain the appearance of the glowing by the ordinary electric breakdown in the supplying high voltage inputs. However, the experimental results described below cannot be explained 
by electric breakdown only. The first argument is that supplying a static voltage of, say, 10 kilovolts, just such a tension amplitude appears at the moment of the current disruption. We do not observe electric breakdown on the power high voltage inputs. And so here are the various photodiode and so forth uh, with the pulse. So A, uh, that's the tension oscillogram, load uh, oscillogram, signal from the photodiode and signal from the photomultiplier. So these are all in tune. The second argument relates to the significant difference between the duration of the current pulse, 0.15 milliseconds, and that of the glowing, 5 milliseconds. However, the recombination time of plasma, which appeared in the air, 0.1 milliseconds, is much smaller than the observed glowing duration, which does not allow us to explain the observed glowing duration by electric breakdown during the current pulse. In the experiments, the spectrum of the glowing and the dynamics of the ball-like plasma formation, BPF, were studied. So they list some uh, equipment they, they used. So here is basically a schematic of the apparatus used. This is the dielectric surface on the top. These are the electrodes. And outside of where the exploding foil occurred, you've got this ball-like plasma formation here. And these are the various detectors, video cameras, uh, and so forth. So yes, the two here, this is the high voltage leads, uh, ball-like plasma formation above, and dielectric cover number five. A mirror was mounted one meter above the setup at the angle of 45 degrees uh, to the vertical, which permitted us to simultaneously register two projections of the glowing, that is, from the side and from sort of like above. Figure 4b presents time gram, which clearly shows that the glowing appears in the middle between the electrodes above the dielectric cover and has a spherical shape. Using signals from calorimeters, photodiodes, and with the account of the results of spectral measurements, the light energy emitted by BPF was estimated to be about 1 kilojoules. Based on the results of more than 100 tests, the typical dynamics of the spherical-like glowing can be described as follows. At the moment of the current disruption, a very bright, diffuse glowing emerges in the channel above the setup. Here we go. This is this diffuse glowing here above the setup. Figure 4a. As if the total space is glowing, then the glowing fades. And in the next spot, a spherical-like glowing is clearly seen. This is the spherical-like glowing. And what you are seeing here is the mirror that's at 45 degrees. So you, you get to see the spherical from the side, and you get to see it from above. So you can see its position. Then the glowing fades, and in the next spot, a spherical-like glowing is clearly seen. No dynamics is observed during the subsequent 3 to 4 milliseconds for C, D, E. And then the glowing sphere starts dividing into many small balls. In some experiments, the ball was noted to rise by 15 to 30 centimeters above the dielectric cover and then disassociate, dissociate, figure 4F. So... Here, this is the ball, and it's not really changing. This is the uh, top view, this is the side view. Top view, side view, and then it basically explodes and falls apart into lots of little small balls that go on their merry way. It should be noted that the characteristic feature of the spherical plasma formation, ball BPF, is its selectivity with respect to the earth coating of the power and diagnostic cables. In experiments where the earths of the high voltage cables were not thoroughly insulated, the BPF often shorted on the cable coating, as is seen from the EOT grams. This fact was also supported by measurements of currents I on the shunt built into the power cable coating, as seen from figure 5. At the moment when the BPF touches the cable coating, a current emerges in the circuit, the so-called echo. So this is the pulse, the initial pulse, and this is the echo when it touches the uh, cable that is grounded. So it's trying to find ground, and this is basically what ball lightning likes to do. 
and when it this this structure that somehow has come out from inside of the reactor where the explosion occurred and settled above the dielectric if it then gets an opportunity to discharge into the ground it will do that and the ball lightning type object fades away a distinctive feature of the experiment under discussion is spectral measurements it is the result of the spectral measurements that became a key to understanding the physics of BPF and largely determined the direction of further studies. This is what I would like to do with Roisin Amaza. I would like to do spectral measurements of the gas exposing various metals and I would also like to do it with uh, Brown's gas as well. But I think this is my big want for further research on these types of gases. Figure 6 reveals the spectral line structure in the entire spectral band. In addition, a continuum is also seen, especially in the red part of the optical spectrum. So here we go. We have spe uh, the spectrums in the middle, or on the top in this case, and either side you have copper and zinc standards. And on the bottom here, you have uh, an iron standard. The identification of spectral lines led to two unexpected results. First, no oxygen and nitrogen lines were found, i.e. it's not kind of exciting those type of atoms, and you would expect them to be there because you've got 78% of the area's nitrogen and a lot of it's oxygen. Only very weak traces of them were present in separate shots, whereas just these lines are always seen during electric discharge in the air. Second, a lot of lines, more than 1,000 lines in individual shots, and accordingly, a lot of corresponding chemical elements were discovered. The spectral analysis revealed that the most abundant elements in plasma were titanium and iron, even the very weak lines of iron were detected, I guess of titanium as well. Copper, zinc, chromium, nickel, calcium, sodium. If the presence of copper and zinc lines in the spectrum can be explained by sliding discharge along the setup units and power supply cables, the presence of the other lines cannot be interpreted. So basically he's saying if it's because there's some sort of electrical discharge going up the wires uh, that, that is causing these copper and zinc lines, then where did the other stuff come from? Since titanium foils were exploded, the presence of titanium lines suggested that some fraction of the foil material penetrates through the seals to occur above the setup. So something in the reactor below here has allowed the titanium to come up and form this plasma formation here. So this is something that you see with kind of ball lightning things. They appear to be able to go through other matter. The table demonstrates that the original foil consists of 99.7% of titanium. The isotope analysis of the foil shows that titanium isotopes are present in their natural abundance. So here is the constituents of the foil in fraction of atoms percent. The sample was first evaporated to yield a dry sediment, which was then carefully mixed to a homogeneous state, and after that was subjected to mass spectrometer analysis. The mass spectrometer in use uh, measured atomic masses starting from carbon, so you can't see lithium, you can't see hydrogen, and so on. Also, you can't see gases uh, um, in that mass spectrometer. The isotope ratio strongly changes in the titanium remained after the shot. The comparison of the histograms reveals that the percentage of shortage of titanium-48 in figure 7b coincides with the shortage in titanium in figure 7a. So you have this thing here where you have uh, titanium and essentially uh, 48 goes down but the other uh, isotopes relatively go up. Um, and here are the abundance of atoms, and you've got vanadium, nickel, barium, and lead in 0 0.1 to 0.01% of the amount that's there. Um, it says percent comp composition of uh, atoms of alien elements in the sample. The fraction of titanium atoms in the experiment products is 92%. So essentially, it's gone from 99.7% 
to 92 percent and the ratio uh, or the amount of percent of the atoms in the products are here. Now if we go to the Parkamov tables that uh, were developed by myself and Philip Power, uh, you can see titanium is mostly titanium 48 and 74 percent roughly of natural titanium and if you look at uh, the fusion products here and what I've done is, and I'll explain this later, I've said I'm only putting a boson in here and only putting a boson in here and bo boson in here. But you can fill around with these. But essentially what you get is you've got carbon. We know carbon looks like it's in there because we know that exotic vacuum objects, when they travel through materials, they can capture carbon and it's uh, traveling through this polyethylene or uh, it's, it's a, a plastic which uh, will have carbon in it. And it's producing nickel, nickel, nickel and magnesium in the fusion sense. And here uh, we have a whole bunch of reactions. And you can see the number one reaction, and this is with boson in, boson in and uh, anything out. You can see that the number one reaction here is uh, carbon-12 with titanium-48 uh, leads to helium, which it can't detect, and iron-56, which it detects to be the most. Carbon-12 with titanium-46 goes to helium which it can't detect and iron 54 which is another isotope of iron and so on um, now if you suggest that uh, it would only like to produce bosons out and i change the switch there this would kill uh, cobalt uh, 59 potentially um, I, I can't remember offhand uh, it certainly would kill the the, the nickel 61 because that's a fermionic nuclei um, anyway so you can see the range of elements here so we've got uh, sodium, silicon, phosphorus may be a gas, so, uh, sulfur might do sulfur dioxide, so that might be a gas, um, uh, chlorine a gas, but anyway, potassium, calcium, titanium, chromium, iron, nickel. So what does he see? He sees, well, I don't know how he's seeing the, the boron here, uh, because uh, I thought he couldn't see below carbon, but anyway, um, so, sodium, uh, magnesium, aluminium, silicon, calcium, chromium, iron, copper and zinc. Uh, if you uh, tweak the uh, the B only here you will end up um, with getting uh, copper and zinc in there as well. So uh, essentially we see all of the main products that are produced here and it is as well to note that uh, these are the rock forming elements. And when I saw him in Sochi in October the 3rd, 2018, where uh, he gave uh, this presentation, I raised the point uh, that a lot of what he was seeing were the rock forming elements. Okay, so the fraction of the titanium atoms in the experiment products is 92%. All measures were taken to provide the purity of the experiment. All electrodes were made of highly purified titanium. New polyethylene caps were used in each shot. All seals were also made of polyethylene. Since the pressure in the chamber increases during the shot due to ohmic heating and chemical reaction of titanium with water, nothing can penetrate the chamber from the outside. So only titanium and possibly carbon is expected to be in the sample. However, in mass spectra of the samples obtained more than 200 experiment lines of elements, uh, alien elements were detected which were absent in the original material. Uh, of the exploding foil electrodes. To avoid possible errors in measuring mass spectra, some control samples were divided into three parts and directed to three different mass spectrometers in different laboratories. And they use a range of other techniques. And again, you can find the zinc and the iron and the titanium with uh, some X-ray analysis here, calcium, uh, potassium, silicon, and aluminium and magnesium. Uh, the mean fraction of the titanium transformation is 4%. It was a, a little higher in the case above. Thus, the experiments using titanium foil as load revealed the presence of the same alien elements. The same conclusion was obtained from spectrometric measurements. Now, we have looked at the tungsten exposed to a Mars gas, and it has very specific elements in there. I would like to see when we expose that with a spectrometer, do we see the spectral lines for those elements that seem to be synthesized as a, as a relation uh, to um, being exposed to the Mars gas? And also, for instance, with, say, the uh, titanium here, do we see the same kind of production of elements in here and in these little uh, balls that uh, are produced, which I will um, 
show you a video of how they were produced. Um, but essentially that is with water. So um, it's a kind of similar setup, but just using a Mars gas and creating ball-like plasma uh, structures, which you will see. So this is the mean elements. And like I say, all of these elements are very easy to predict using the Parkamov reaction tables. They're basically what you get. As noted above, a correlation has been observed between the fraction of mixtures in the text and the skewness of the isotropic distribution of titanium remaining in the sample. In all isotopic analysis of sediments, the relative fraction of isotopes at 46, 47, 49, 50 were observed to increase and titanium 48 to decrease. This experimental fact enabled us to suppose that all the decrease of titanium is due to disappearing of titanium 48 isotope. The plot in figure 10 is drawn by assuming the total disappearing burning out of titanium load is due to only the burning out of titanium 48. So here we go. You basically got alien element fraction is going up and decrease of titanium 48 is so the amount of titanium 48 is going down and you get more alien or, or new elements synthesized the more um, uh, uh, titanium 48 that is burned. And it says here, actually, figure 11 down here presents the histogram of mean composition of the products for experiments with zirconium foil as load. The original zirconium foil contained 1.1% of niobium, which was subtracted from the final product comp composition. Comparing figure 9 and figure 11 uh, suggests each original load produces individual spectrum of chemical elements. The statement holds uh, for other foils, iron, nickel, lead, vanadium, tantalum, which were used in other experiments. So they're basically saying you get a spectrum out and it's based on the input elements you use. The mean percent of atoms of alien elements in five tests with zirconium load. Since the transformation of elements could be associated with some radioactive emission, intensive search for gamma radiation and neutrons have been done. To register gamma radiation, integral dosimeters, X-ray films, and cesium iodide uh, scintillator detectors with PMT-30 have been used. Uh, no significant X-ray flux has been detected in any experiment. As followed from mass spectrome spectrometric results, the number of acts of transformation was uh, 1019 to 1020 per shot. So clearly, even one gamma ray photon per transformation act would lead to an enormous gamma ray flux of uh, 1020. In order to register neutrons, we use two plastic scintillator detectors with PMT 30. In figure 12, the typical signal from PMT 30 is presented with a duration of 100 nanoseconds. Such a short duration was a great surprise, since the current pulse duration was 20 milliseconds. The time delay, and so he, he kind of goes in to explain this, and basically he, he has, uh, uh, in order to measure the time of arrival of particles, a special transformer was designed, which formed the standard pulse of 10 milliseconds from the external signal with 10 nanoseconds. Thus, the study pulse from the detector triggered an oscillograph, then was directed to the oscillograph, uh, oscillograph input through a delay line and only after that entered the transformer and ACP. The time delay in turn on of two oscillographs registered signals from two plastic detectors allowed us to measure the radiation propagation velocity. It was found to be 20 to 40 meters per second. Such a low velocity precluded signals to be neutrons since they must have been ultra cold and could not reach the detector, and moreover, to overcome the light shielding cover made of aluminium. To understand the nature of the radiation and obtain its self-portrait, uh, self a method using photoemulsions was applied. So basically, it's not neutrons. You're not seeing neutrons. Whatever it is, it's too slow, and therefore it could only be controlled neutrons, but it cold neutrons, but it, it wasn't cold neutrons because it would ne never have reached the detectors. So it's kind of what the Russians call fake neutrons or pseudo neutrons. The following materials have been used in the experiment: a fluorographic film, radiographic media, medical film, and high resolution photo emulsions. The inspection of the processed materials revealed micro and macro effects. Macro effects included those that can be seen by naked eye or using a magnify magnification glass with up to five times magnification. 
Micro effects included those seen under magnification from 75 to 2025 times. Films and uh, photo plates were set at different distances from the centre of electric explosion, from 20 centimetres to 4 metres in radial and normal planes, assuming cylindric symmetry of the experiment. So here's the setup. This is the uh, ball plasma uh, like formation here. You have here, you have electric explosion foils in this container here. And then three, you have uh, nuclear emulsions here on a plate. Then four here and here, you have films, uh, film banks and individuals. Five over here, you have magnetic field coils and six over here, and I guess here, you have films near permanent magnets. One set on the North Pole and one set on the South Pole and arranged at 90 degrees to each other. All the materials were carefully wrapped in black paper, which had preliminary uh, been inspected to have no damages. After the exposure in the setup and developing photo detectors, the paper has been inspected once again. The very first experiments revealed a wide variety of tracked forms, including continuous straight lines, dumbbell-like caterpillar tracks, and long tracks with a complex form similar to spirals and gratings. Figure 14a demonstrates a typical very long 1-3mm to three millimeter track similar to that of a caterpillar or tyre cover protector. These tracks are characterised by having a second parallel trace with darkening and length different from the main one. The track presented in figure 14a was formed on the fluorographic film with emulsion layer thickness 10 micrometers. In figure 14b, a magnified fragment of the track is shown, which clearly demonstrates a complicated pattern. Notably, that with a grain size of 1 micrometers, the track width is about 20 microns, and this is the classic size of a basic EVO. The estimate of the energy of particles obtained from the darkening area is 700 microelectron volts, assuming Coulomb breaking. Taking into account the position of the photo detector shown in figure 13 and the track size, the track cannot be explained by alpha, beta or gamma radiation. Recall the RF film is wrapped in the black paper and is surrounded by the air. To check the nature of strange radiation, the remnants of the foil and water were extracted from the channel after the explosion and put into a Petri cap. The sample and the photo detector were set 10 centimetres away as shown in figure 15A. So 15A and so we have uh, some detector here and we have another detector here with a material. The film pressed to fiberglass washer was used and the entire detector was enveloped in black paper. The fiberglass washer was used because in the previous experiments we noted that the strange radiation clearly demonstrates properties of the transition radiation. Now you might be asking, what is transition radiation? Transition radiation is a form of electromagnetic radiation emitted when a charged particle passes through inhomogeneous media such as a boundary between two different media. This is in contrast to Cherenkov radiation, which occurs when a charged particle passes through homogeneous dielectric medium at a speed greater than the phase velocity of the electromagnetic waves in that medium. Okay, so this is kind of like, it doesn't like to pass through a material that has impedance changes, much like, much like uh, Ken Shoulders was saying. But also, what is glass fibre? Well, glass fibre contains silicon dioxide, calcium dioxide, aluminium oxide, boron oxide, 5 to 10%. What do we know? Boron seems to interact with strange radiation. And here we have potassium oxide, depending on whether it's E-glass or S-glass, up to 2%. Now, in uh, Chalani's latest reactors, uh, the ones with the sheath, he has glass fibre braiding covering his wires. That means he has potassium oxide and up to 10% boron. In addition, there is fluorides. 
fluorides up to 1% if he's using e-glass. I think he is using e-glass. And so if it is e-glass, then we have fluorides. And if you remember from my presentation studying the observations of Ed Storms and Brian Scanlan uh, in 2012, they uh, found that they were observing radiation which I felt was only consistent with potassium and fluorine being available to an exotic vacuum object and converting some of the 39 potassium into potassium 40 and then onto calcium 40 and also the fluorine in the fluorides to fluorine 18 from fluorine 19 which then decayed but and you ended up with bosons out in the case of fluorine 18, oxygen 18. So those two things are, I think, very important. And I think if people want to observe strange radiation, maybe when they're using X-ray film like this, they should put some e-glass and press it up against the X-rays. And you might find that you have a better time of it. Now, in the case of a future presentation, which I'll share, Iron, I think, is going to be very important, and it's interesting to note that in the case of uh, Lion, he actually placed his x-rays in a tin, and the Lion reactor was next to them, but the actual x-rays were pressed next to the tin. So I think these things are going to be very important to understand why you are seeing radiation traces when otherwise you might not be able to see them. The exposure time was 18 hours. The result is presented in figure 15b. The inspection of figure 14 and 15 suggests that the darkening of film in both cases was due to identical reasons. This in turn implies that the radiation was not caused by acceleration and had a nuclear origin. It should be noted that the position of the detector planes normal to the radius vector in both cases allows the interpretation that the source of the registered emission moved with a non-zero angular velocity, i.e. it's spinning around as it's moving. So this is one type of film. This is the film, I believe, that was on the top. And this is the film that is over to the side. So these are two different types of detectors. This has the, um, the material, the fiberglass, pressed to the back of it. And this is on top of the Petri dish. So two different types of detectors re uh, revealing um, the same kind of tracks. A series of, of experiments were performed to study the effects of external magnetic field on the picture observed using a magnetic coil located as shown in figure 13. So we will look at that. Uh, where is it? Figure 13 here. So they've got a magnetic coil here and here and then they've also got these uh, permanent magnets here uh, with the film. And the magnetic coil here, there's something coming out here, it goes through the magnetic coil and it uh, interacts with this nuclear emulsion. In the case of these ones, it's coming out and uh, it's interacting with either the north or the south pole of these magnets. Using a magnetic coil located as shown in figure 13, a weak magnetic field of 20 G, Gauss I guess, was imposed in the site of the explosion. The photo detectors were set as shown as I just showed you. The typical tracks registered are shown in 16A and B with a nuclear photo emulsion as photo detector. It is seen from the figure that the track strongly changes the trace to become comet-like in shape. So you have this kind of round thing that's kind of slightly offset and it's kind of maybe it's spinning around like this or spinning around like that and it's traveling in a direction and it has these kind of like uh, wake in front of it and this material coming off to the side. So this is the photographic emulsion that is placed like this with the coil uh, next uh, in between it and the, uh, the plasma ball type thing. And this is where you have three one, two, three uh, um, pieces of uh, film uh, in front of a um, fixed magnet. And so you can see that because it's located over slightly to the, the left of each of the plates, that this cannot be uh, an artifact on the plates. It has to be some sort of lensing to that. Let's say it's a, a near-dimmium magnet like this one. Um, and uh, 
you're seeing the track like that. Uh, recorded. Now this actually reminds me of the Bogdanovich paper, this structure here, where it's kind of slightly toroidal and slightly offset with this little tail and it really does look a lot like you're, you're seeing on the head here. In some experiments the detector and not the entire setup was put in the magnetic field. Figure 16C, uh, 16C, this flaky trace, uh, figure 16C shows the traces obtained by a photodetector consisting of three uh, films folded together and located, located near a samarium cobalt magnet with a 1.2 kilogram field, um, uh, as shown in figure 13B, as I showed you before. The positions of darkening in figure 16C coincide geometrically, which excludes them to be artifacts. The energy absorbed in the three films with it, uh, with Account only the photo emulsion layer thickness, 10 micrometers, is estimated to be 700 mega electron volts. Thus, it is clearly seen that the magnetic field affects the strange radiation. In addition to the tracks shown, we have registered some quite different in shape from the classical ones. Part of these tracks not presented in this paper is very similar to scratches or ink spots. Exactly the same tracks were observed in experiments by Matsumoto using other types of photodetectors in experiments with breakdown in water. This precludes us from unconditionally relating them to artifacts. However, already today we can say with a significant reliability that one or two types of particles can hardly explain all tracks which appear during the registration of the strange radiation. Now, it gets really quite interesting here. Uh, um, this, this kind of magnetic uh, aspect is something that inspired me. But like I say, I only briefly read the paper uh, prior to um, doing my tests on uh, echo fuel. Discussion of experimental results, a magnetonucleon catalysis. And this does sound like uh, Shishkin et al.'s a magnetotoro electrical radiation. Anyway, uh, and if you look at the latest work of uh, Bogdanovich, which we did put on our Facebook um, uh, site and so forth, um, he has observed uh, uh, magnetic, what they consider magnetic monopoles. But uh, this is really interesting what you're going to see here. And it's relevant to another presentation that I'm going to give later in the week. A purely visual association between BPF and ball lightning arises. There are at least two major problems in physics of ball lightning. The reason for appearance and failure to explain the source of radiation. So, you know, <laughs> it appeared, you know, and they're saying that there weren't the lines of oxygen and there weren't the lines of um, nitrogen, but there seems to be a, 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 an illumination or an irradiation. Anyway, the experimental results reported here can suggest a reason for the BPF appearance. Indeed, the optical spectra analysis and the mass spectrometry results are in qualitative agreement. This allows us to suppose that during the process of fract a fraction of materials leaks through the seals. However, even if not uh, to analyze how plasma penetrates through the seals, two questions remain. Why all the plasma coalesces into a ball and does not dissociate, and why this occurs in such a short time, since we do observe the BPF already on the first frame in some shots. So basically what he's saying is, if you are to suggest that there, uh, let's say this is the basic schematic, that something is escaping through here, it's coming out through the seals, it's going up, it's going round, why does it appear literally instantaneously above the dielectric? And why doesn't it just come out and disperse and go over here? You know, <laughs> why? <laughs> One can try to explain the BPF using the cluster model or the fractal ball model. However, we have looked for a hypothesis which can explain all experimental facts. Such a hypothesis, in our opinion, could be the formation of magnetically charged particles. They're referring them as magnetic monopoles. The first attempt to explain the ball lightning by magnetic monopoles was done in the paper 13 in 1991. However, the assumption that magnetic monopoles form in the plasma discharge in water could be one possible reason for the obtained experimental results, however unusual this assumption might appear. 
Indeed, a wide track similar to the trace of a crawling caterpillar, 17, was expected just for classical monopoles in references 18 and 19. So this was Amaldi and Baroni and Baudia search for Dirac magnetic monopoles. And the, what they're looking for is the Dirac and uh, Schwinger magnetic monopoles. And they are from, respectively, predicted in 1931 and 1966. So the estimate energy for, uh, dissipated in the emulsion by radiation of one gig electron volts coincides with that expected for magnetic monopoles. A visual change in the track shape observed in the presence of a magnetic field also gives support to this assumption. To confirm directly the fact of magnetic monopole creation in plasma discharge, an experiment was performed using the idea from paper 20, in which iron foils were suggested to be taken as a monopole trap. In our experiment, we used three iron 57 foils. Why do you do that? Because it has a specific MOS power signal. And iron 57, well, you know what? If we go to the element data here on uh, nanosoft.co.nz and we look at iron, iron 57 is quite a small percentage of the overall iron. So iron 57 here uh, is just 2.19%. So this isn't a cheap experiment. They were serious about this at the Kirchhoff Institute which has an ideal structure and a significant field near the nucleus. Since both north and south magnetic monopoles must appear, the foils under study were located near different poles of a strong magnet with the magnetic field strength 1 kilo in anticipation of selection of monopoles. I just commented here, brilliant use of iron 57. <laughs> the N monopoles were expected to be attracted by the S pole and the S monopoles by the N pole of the magnet. The magnets were set at a distance of 70 centimeters away from the site of electric explosion. The third foils was used as a standard. Due to a large magnetic charge, the monopoles captured in the trap must change the magnetic field near the iron 57 nucleus, which can be measured by Mossbauer effect for a sufficiently large number of the trapped monopoles. The results of measurements showed that in the foils located near the N pole, the absolute value of the superfine magnetic field increased by 0.24 in Another foil, south, it decreased by approximately the same amount, 0.29. The measurement error was 0.012, and there's the overall data. Taking into account that the magnetic field in 57 Fe has, an, has the opposite sign with respect to its magnetization, we can state with certainty that S particles at the north pole of the magnet increase the negative superfine field, while the particles of the opposite sign decrease it, with relative change being this. So there we go. They are basically using this very clever trick to capture in iron, and we'll see this come back again, as I say, later in the week. Uh, these types of structures, um, which are not just one uh, potential polarity, Using the hypothesis of magnetic monopole formation, we can suggest that the observed BPF are magnetic clusters. This is why I don't think I'm too far off with this, where each substructure, which is itself potentially one of these large structures, because it's fractal, uh, is magnetic and it links together and then that links together and then this can link together and then very, very large ones of these can form into large, large structures. Uh, and I've said before that I believe that they can go into any of the carbon allotropes and they can get a bit wishy-washy, but um, there we go. So it's a magnetic clusters. In analogy with nine, we can suppose that the role of iron is played by the monopole coupled with the foil atom nucleus. So essentially, the, the, the overall iron 
is a nucleus, so it's completely ionized, let's say, the atom, and it's captured it magnetically inside this magnetic cluster. I think it's wonderful, and that, that in itself is an ion. Now, we know from Shishkin's work that these magnetotoro electrical radiation, of which uh, string vortex solitons, which are supposedly cold uh, neutrino uh, condensed clusters, uh, they also capture uh, nuclei of atoms, and therefore they can transport from them from the inside of a reactor to the outside of the reactor. But not just one iron ne necessarily. Uh, in the in the studies of uh, shoulders, he was saying for every hundred thousand electrons that start to produce the exotic vacuum object, there are one ion. The main regularities experimentally. Uh, observed during the transformation of chemical elements can be summarized as follows. The transformation occurs predominantly with even, even isotope. Now, this is effectively a boson, uh, and I, I, that's one of the reasons why I selected uh, bosons here. However, some bosons which do take part in Lenner reactions are odd-odd, for instance, in the case of... <laughs> Uh, deuteron nuclei and so that's one proton and one one neutron and so um, I, I predominantly he's not he's obviously leaving it open and, and I'm saying that for instance in the case of some experiments you have a proton going in which is obviously not even even it's just a proton and in the case of uh, fluorine 19 it's obviously uh, a fermion so um, yeah and it can't be uh, even even but anyway he's saying that it's even even and if you look at titanium here um, if we go back to here there are only uh, titanium uh, 48 of which titanium 48 is as I said at the beginning 74 percent and then there are uh, two fermionic uh, nuclei uh, which are not uh, even even they're odd even experiments with foils made of different chemical elements have shown that they transform into individual spectra of elements and the statistical weight of each element is determined by concrete conditions. So basically input elements determines output elements. So uh, you are going to get a spread of elements. This system likes to reorganize matter. That is the whole point of the Parkhamov reaction tables and uh, their cascade functions. What you are witnessing here is just the first iteration and in the case of a, a one-point explosion then you are getting a first iteration aren't you but if you have a process where it's constantly sparking or it's constantly charge pumping or or activating the structure you're going to get cascade reactions all nuclei of chemical elements resulted from the transformation are in the ground non-excited state, i.e. no appreciable radioactivity has been found. This is very common and it's what you would expect with energy positive neutrino driven uh, re reactions. To explain the element transformation, we have put forward the working hypothesis of magnetonucleon catalysis. So again, you have a highly magnetic cluster that is grabbing the nucleon of an atom uh, and that is uh, doing the catalysis. And, and in fact, you know, it's a lot of things <laughs> occurring at the same time. Um, we introduced this term to designate the process which supposedly occurs in the plasma channel. The essence of the MNC is that the magnetic monopole with a large magnetic charge and even small kinetic energy can overcome Coulomb barrier and uh, become bound with atomic nucleus. The MNC must have many common features with muon catalysis in which the Coulomb barrier is substantially decreased due to the large mass of the mu meson. Since the magnetic monopole seems to be a stable particle, the MNC may be uh, more effective. Now, it's, it's interesting that they are referring to the muon uh, cata catalysis because uh, Ken Shoulders is basically saying that the muon, which is 207 or whatever times the mass of an electron, is basically just a charge cluster. It's like lots of electrons. Uh, and how, how you rationalize that is up to you. But that's what he's saying. Um, the experiments established uh, that, tra that the transformation and hence the MNC occurs only inside the plasma channel. So that's what their experiments have shown. Um, and so that's it. So 
Uh, I hope you uh, really take some time to look at this experiment. The big takeaways for me is that they created a type of ball lightning. They replicated some of the observations of Takaaki Matsumoto. They um, coined the phrase strange radiation. They clearly observed the fact that uh, whatever it is is able to capture carbon and titanium and that with carbon and titanium you get the observed products coming from the reaction that they observed both by using the uh, spectral analysis of the light emitted from the plasma formation that occurred above the reactor, this uh, ball-like plasma formation, and they also observed it in the material that was left in the distilled water when they uh, produced the dried material from that. And then the magnetic, uh, obviously this is, it would seem that it's coming through uh, reactors material. It's breaking up into these little other micro ball lightning that uh, it likes to ground just like normal ball lightning does. And that they saw the transmutation that was effectively consuming the titanium 48. And this is something that I will look for if I can. Uh, in the Mars gas uh, uh, testing on titanium here, which was with water, and that they see a range of different elements based on the uh, material going in. This is uh, in the case of zirconium. And by using a wide array of uh, arrangement of detectors and placing them on magnets as well, both north and south pole, uh, uh, in the case of this art use of iron 57 they were able to determine it doesn't kind of matter what kind of detector you use in the development process you get to see pretty much identical type tracks and then the magnetic this sort of field here producing these structures that are very similar to uh, what Bogdanovich saw here and these ones where you have co-located on three films something where you have a, a magnetic uh, uh, a fixed magnetic field uh, from a permanent magnet and it's pulling these structures uh, in uh, are all good data to show that the structure that is active in low energy nuclear reactions has a highly magnetic nature and uh, then the, the kicker for me is this use of iron 57 plates uh, and so there we go um, Thank you very much for your time uh, and I will see you in the next video.